Thanks to all the organizers for this great opportunity. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Power to the Types. In this talk, I'm going to show how in Scala, we could rely on types to make powerful programs. But first of all, we need to understand what types are and how could we define them using Scala, especially for the newcomers uh, to uh, get started using Scala and um, understand the basics. And how could we use types in functions? And then we are going to see how could we define type classes. And um, I'm going to mention some popular algebraic data structures like semigroup, monoid, functor, and monad. To start, let's see in, uh, in Scala, like Scala combines two uh, programming paradigms, object-oriented and functional programming concepts, and gives the power to the types using the strength of both approaches. The idea of object-oriented programming is based on the concept of objects, which are the containers for the attributes and properties, which are the data, and the operations, um, the code in general, which would be basically the methods. And functional programming idea is like basically is based on um, programming using functions and composing them together and dealing with immutable data types that couldn't be changed only by passing them around functions and build new data type from them that has the changes that we want to do. And Scala supports first class functions. We are going to see this more in detail, but basically the idea is that functions are treated like values. We will see more in detail. And so to make it clear, the combination of two concepts provides scalability. This is why Scala is called Scala, because it's, it gives scalability to our programs. Object-oriented makes it easy to structure system and adapt them according to the new uh, requests or demand to make uh, a change to our programs. And functional programming adapts the, um, like adapts the, make the types. Uh, we can have the change by composing uh, functions together, and this will enable us to have um, easy and clear code that uh, is easy to uh, uh, reason about uh, from its types. How would be this? We will see it in details uh, in uh, uh, when we are going to cover functions, but the first thing to see is types, because in functions, we are going to use types. In Scala, like in general, types, uh, um, because, uh, okay, because Scala is, um, is a higher level programming and statically typed language that provides type checking during the compiler time, this helps us to produce correct programs that are easy to reason about. And most of functional programs say if it compiles, it works. So to see how could we define a simple type, uh, a value that uh, of type int, for example, we use a val here and um, and each type, for example, integer or byte, string, boolean, each type 
has a set of possible values that also we can do algebraic operations. For example, for integer, we can use the addition operation and the multiplication. We also can have types that combine other types. These types are called algebraic data types. We can have a case class. We are, when we use a case class, we can combine uh, types in a single structure. For example, here, when we see setting, it has capacity and is enabled field. And for when we, when we see that we are defining and setting in our program, we are going to expect that to have both of these fields, capacity and is enabled. And we will expect that the capacity would have 256 possible values because, if, because from its type and is enabled could have two possible values. So from this, we can, we can reason um, about this uh, product type. We can say, because um, like why it's called a product because we can say this field uh, settings has capacity field and is enabled and the if we want to uh, know how many possible values that we can have we will multiply the possible values for each uh, um, property for this uh, case class and for some types like this is also an alge uh, algebraic data type uh, using seal trade we can define some types. For example, we can have a seal trade coin flip and it could be either heads or tails, one of them. So some types enables us to, um, to construct or to combine types that can be one of them. Like when we see in your program uh, that you have something of type coin flip, you will expect to have one of these values and the, the possible values that you would expect that are two, head or uh, tails. And if you wonder what is sealed, like for tra trait is like interface and sealed is uh, provides uh, exhaustive check-in to check all members of a sealed trait must be defined at the same uh, source file, which is, uh, which could be helpful when we have, um, when uh, for the compilers, when we have a pattern matching, it will uh, directly uh, check the um, exhaustivity and uh, using SILT, it makes it easier for the compiler to check only in a single source uh, code. We can also have a product type that uses some type. For example, because I'm like I'm fan uh, of uh, inspirational quotes every day, we can have a daily quotes with a motivating message. We can have a case class, for example, quotes that we use um, uh, a day day uh, of week, which is a some type and the code has a message. And when you say, uh, when you see quote, you know that we will have both of these values. Nice. We can also have a parameterized algebraic data types like option. Option, um, this uh, is built based on the type parameter. When you see option, it could be, it might be none, which is one possible value or sum of uh, a value and this value uh, it depends to the type of a so you can know how many possible values you might have for option of boolean by saying okay none plus two possible values of uh, type boolean and this is uh, this is a sum type 
uh, and uh, some and some some of value uh, will depends to the type parameter. Uh, so to summarize, this is um, like the, the because the Scala is a statically uh, typed uh, programming language. The compiler helps us a lot to provide um, correct programs. And uh, using algebraic data types, we can have more information about what the program does. We will see it more in detail when we will use these types. So now let's see it uh, in functions. So functions would uh, takes data as input. We are going to use these algebraic data types or simple types uh, as input and returns data as output. And in the introduction, we saw that there are some criteria in like the, the idea behind functional programming. Let's see them now in detail and try to understand them. It's very important in your functional program to have pure functions. And pure functions should satisfy different criteria. One of them is the pure function should be total, which means that if, um, like we can know what to expect when we see to the input and the output uh, types. For example, make int is uh, a function that takes a string and expect we when we read this we will expect an integer as uh, an an output but this is not true it is a lie because sometimes string would like not sometimes like we can put string in uh, uh, with um, we can have uh, non uh, numeric uh, values in string so it will throw an exception. To be honest with what the function does, we should express this in types and make the output as, uh, for example, a try, try. So when we look now to the function, we will, we will know what to expect and it will be uh, true. That what it will express more about what really the function does. We will say, okay, this function um, requires a string and might succeed with an integer or fail. And then when we will use this function, we are going to um, uh, like to handle the error or we, we are going to know, uh, we are going to provide also correct programs. We, we will know that there might be successful case. So in this case, we will continue this program. Otherwise, we will handle this exception and what we want to do in case of failure. So this is helpful to uh, make a good program. And also, uh, a pure function should be deterministic. When we have a function with inputs, when we call it with the same input, it should always return the same result as before, which enables us to test this function. For example, when we have increment, function, for example, here it is not, this function is not deterministic because when, whenever we call in increment, even with the same input, we will always get different values. We don't know what is going on inside this function and we cannot test it. To make it deterministic, we need to have either, for example, we know that we will increment by one, we do i plus one, or for example, we want to increment with different numbers, we can add it as a, an argument so we can test it easier, easier. And also it's very important that the function, a pure function should, shouldn't have side effects. When we have a computation, a function supposed to do some computation, it should use only its input to provide this result and it shouldn't interact with the outside of the context of this function. It shouldn't interact with the outside world. And if we have deterministic and free of side effect function, we are going to satisfy referential, referential transparency criteria, which means 
that we can replace the function by its evaluation result uh, without affecting the meaning of the program. So this enables us, like it's, it provides, it's, it guarantees that we can test this function. For immutability, uh, we are going to use in our programs immutable data types and the operations of a program should map inputs, input values to output values rather than change the data in, in place. So for example, here, when we have uh, lists and we want to use the uh, plus plus operation to uh, concatenate, to add two lists uh, to each others, we are going to construct a new list, but the first list will not be updated. It will not be changed. And uh, Scala supports first class functions. It means that the function is treated like values, other values like integer or string or any other uh, value. So it, because functions can be defined as a data type, we can uh, associate, for example, a type alias to uh, a specific function. Let's say we have a predicate that takes for a given int, it returns a Boolean. Um, uh, we can associate it uh, with, uh, we can uh, define a predicate type and we can pass, uh, in general, we can pass types as input uh, or return them. And here we can pass predicate as type, but also we can, for sure, we can pass the whole function, um, like int, uh, for example, uh, a function that requires an int and uh, returns Boolean here. And this is called, this function filter is called higher order function because it accepts uh, other function. And also we can have, uh, a function that returns uh, another function as a result. And this is also called a higher order function. So, uh, and here how we can uh, use, we can, uh, we can, uh, the input, when we define this function, uh, the input uh, could be, uh, we can check, either we use the whole Boolean and, uh, make uh, this operation or if we can we want to check if the boolean is true or false etc we can use this syntax we can also compose functions together so here uh, we compose uh, we compose is valid with get message if the answer is valid uh, we will get the message so we need to provide the answer to be able to to get the boolean out of is valid and then we call get message <clears throat> that will uh, will uh, take the result of uh, the is valid and then following this result it will display the message nice and other point that function in general um, like for example for a function with one argument it is uh, the compiler will automatically uh, uh, consider it as uh, of type of function one. Uh, this, uh, this type is in, uh, built in Scala. So um, function one with uh, the input here and the output here. And there are like, if there are two arguments, it would be function two, uh, et cetera. The compiler will uh, automatically translate, it, uh, translate our uh, functions to this data type. Yeah, to summarize, we saw how we define pure functions, which enables us to test our programs and to reason about the function using its inputs and outputs and how also Scala supports first uh, class functions. Now we are ready to see how could we define type classes. Type classes is a way to define certain operations for a given type. It's like you, uh, you want to add some features and uh, type class instance for a given type provides uh, an implementation for this uh, operation. Let's take an example to understand 
how it works. For example, functional Scala conference, it is a real example that has, uh, this conference has uh, different games and the organizers want to automatically uh, pick the winners for each game and each game, ha uh, each game uh, has uh, uh, its uh, specific rule. So we can define an interface and use it with different implementation. For example, you can have trait game with select winner and that takes list of string and returns the winner. But wait, um, here it's a list of string. It could be something else, but let's, let's try to figure out, okay, with a simple, the simplest example that for a given list of string, we will get uh, the, we will select one of the element of the winner, uh, of the participant. Normally this is the input should be a participant. And then how to implement it, it would be uh, something like just randomly uh, uh, take the, um, the, uh, the element from that list and uh, pick the, uh, the winner if there is like there is no uh, why here is uh, there is a try because when uh, there is um, no participants this will throw an exception because uh, it would be random uh, between zero and zero exclusive so it will uh, throw an exception so in that case we are going to there is no winner uh, but uh, let's back to the point that I mentioned. It, now the participants could be defined by email or by name or by ID. Um, like it should be more generic. And we shouldn't forget the people who are playing the chess game, um, which has different rules to select the winner, not only just randomly. And uh, this picture was... Uh, uh, from Lambda Conference, and this was uh, Tony Morni uh, Morris. I hope he's uh, he's there. So nice. Now we can make uh, the game interface generic. So we will make the participant list generic, and uh, from this list we are going to pick the winner. And for example, for the functional programming tower course raffle, we can pick the winner uh, by email. Uh, we have a list of emails and uh, we will pick uh, the winner. And for chess game, for a given player, there would be in player um, the score for each of them. So there would be some computation uh, for in this implementation. And we can use uh, we can define different games and use different rules. So nice. But now let's use type classes to give the power to the types. Because we have now our uh, parameterized or our generic interface, we can have, um, we can add a companion object and a helper method that can access to the interface game and call select winner. Here, directly we define the helper as select winner because this interface has only a single method, but if it has different methods, we can um, implement apply, for example, that accesses only the interface and then um, using this, uh, we will, uh, using the apply, we, we can, uh, Call different methods, but now for this case, we directly for um, we uh, make sure like this select winner will abstract over the uh, different data types and requires that this data type should have a similar structure as game. So to be able to use this. Uh, this game and um, and access to select winner. There is other way we can do this. 
we can also use the context bound, which is um, like has a constraint. It is like a constraint. It um, adds a constraint to this data type that should be um, should have the same structure as game, and it will the compiler will look whenever we will call it. The compiler will look for uh, for uh, the this game uh, if uh, this data type define it for example we will see it later uh, for example here when we call uh, when we call select winner with different players the compiler because players would be a list of player the compiler directly will try to to uh, look for the implicit game of player because select winner select winner will um, uh, will require that there is an implicit uh, like let's say type class instance for a game with that type a and calling implicitly here to be able to access this interface and interact with uh, with uh, its methods so yeah, and this is how we can um, we can uh, call the we can uh, impl implement the uh, type class instances. Great. Now we manage it to uh, to to see how could we define type classes. So we are ready to cover um, more. Uh, uh, other data, uh, more other type classes like monad and monoid. But to summarize this uh, this uh, section, we saw that we declare instances outside game, and we didn't need to extend game like before, and we were able to get the game features independently with uh, uh, to this type. So. We will be able to have. Uh, we will be able to have uh, also uh, some uh, complicated, more complicated type classes that, for example, read from database or something, um, uh, or interact with different services, and we can test uh, these uh, type classes because um, we can have different implementation for them. So also type classes provides the stability. We can also override instances <clears throat> for the same <clears throat> for the same type by putting a new one uh, in in the scope when we will use it. So it it makes it easier to um, make new instances uh, for the same type. Now let's move to the algebraic data structures. All of them would be, um, it is like the type classes, the syntax, but these data structures has their own algebras, which are supported, which are the supported operations and the laws that, dr that drive or lead uh, these uh, operations. For example, semigroup has the operation combine, and we are going to see more in details the laws uh, that it uh, it should follow. And monoid has uh, is a semigroup. It has the same uh, method as semigroup combine with empty uh, new uh, empty method. And functor has map and monad is all monads are functors, so it has map and an additional operation, a flat map, and all of them has different uh, has uh, different laws. So let's start with semigroup. Semigroup uh, has a combine, and and uh, it is here like to make it a, um, a type class. So in order to be able to define, for example, if we think that our type can be a semigroup. We can 
just implement a type class instance uh, for uh, of type semigroup and access to a semigroup using this apply and call combine. And the law that we should follow is associativity. So we have to make sure that combine uh, that combine respect associativity law. So let's take an example to see. Um, for example, integer can form a semigroup on multiplication operation. Here, for example, uh, we will make sure that uh, multi multiplication is uh, associative. We can take an example and see that a multiplied by b um, multiplied by c is uh, equal to uh, to uh, a multiplied by b and c. And also addition operation respect associativity law. So we can uh, say that int forms a semigroup uh, in uh, addition method. Nice. And also, if we have uh, uh, our own data type, for example, let's say team, and we want to, uh, we will be able, we, we are able to add um, new members from another teams. So we can uh, say that com uh, before this, before we implement this, we need to make sure that combining two teams is associative. So we should take an example. We say, okay, we have these three members. And if we, uh, we try to make sure if they are associative, if we add these members to each other and then, okay, it is associative. So let's, uh, so team forms a semi-group. So let's implement uh, the type class instance to this team. Also, uh, if we want to um, use, for example, we have team and we want to use plus other team, uh, instead of doing semi group of com dot combine team one, team two, we can uh, use extension methods here. So, uh, and, um, use and uh, and also it uh, we should require that this should uh, the the a should be uh, a semi group so we can call uh, combine now for mono monoid it's the same it has combined but also uh, it should uh, have an empty element we should be able if, if we think if we have um, our data type could form a monoid, we should think that it is, is it possible that um, we have an empty element for this type? Also, we should make sure that it satisfies its laws, which are identity and associativity. So when we call for identity law, it means when we, we combine a with empty, it should be equals to A. So empty shouldn't affect the, the computation of, uh, of A. And the same when we combine empty with A, it should be A. And for, for example, when we have, um, we can say that Boolean uh, can form a monoid uh, on and and operation because it satisfies the law of identity. Like for empty, it is true here, the empty. So it will not affect when we do false and and empty, it will be false, it will be the same. And the same if we do true and and empty, it will be true. It will not affect um, the result. And uh, for, uh, so this satisfy uh, identity law and for associativity also, when we try to uh, make three uh, Boolean and try to, to see if they satisfies uh, the associativity law and we, it satisfies. So we can say that 
Boolean forms a monoid on uh, and and operation and also for or or operation, but the empty element in that case would be false. Now let's move to factor. Factor uh, has a map method. It enables us to access a certain container and apply a given function to uh, build a new container with uh, the result of this function. And we see a functor is not like monad or monoid. It doesn't uh, have a simple type here. It has a type constructor f with a, with a single argument. So we can say that functor is a higher kind of type. And the laws for factors are should uh, yeah are uh, identity and composition. For identity law, it is not the same like uh, monoid. It is not a simple value. It is um, it's like a higher order type constructor. So we are going to deal with functions. So for identity, it uh, we should satisfy the identity function um, uh, when we have identity. Uh, map of identity, it should be equals to identity and identity function for a given A, it shouldn't do anything than return on the A. So, and for composition law, for a given F that goes from A to B and J that goes from B to C, we should have a function that goes from A to C, which is the composition of F and G. So to call this compose here and to see it clearer, we will we can compose G. Um, we say G dot compose F to get uh, the function A from A to C. And to, to make sure that a functor satisfies the composition law, we can do map of J compose F should be equals to map of J compose map of F. And this will make sure that there is no side effect in map function. Like even if you can imagine that, for example, map would have a print line if we will do this, we will see one print line. And if we we do map of this and compose ma another map of this, it will be two print lines. So it will not be equals. And we will, um, following the laws of functor, we will know that uh, certain types that will interact with the outside world and have side effects couldn't be functors, for example. Let's take an example uh, option. So uh, we can, uh, for to implement implement the uh, functor uh, like type class instance for uh, option. We can uh, just in case if we have um, the option a if it is none return none if it is sum of a because we have a function that goes from a to b we can make this option of b using uh, by applying the function to the existing a in the in the uh, functor and to make sure that um, this satisfies the identity law we can we can uh, do it ourselves. We say, okay, map of identity, which, which, which would be the function that goes from A to A. And then we apply this function. It would be F of A, which will return A in this case. And in case of none, it would be none. So at the end, it would be here option. It will goes from option of A to option of A. So it will be equal to uh, identity. So map uh, of identity equals to identity. In, so option satisfies one uh, of these uh, rules. Let's see if it satisfies composition law. For example, if we have um, increment 
method and greater than 10 method and we map but, uh, we map uh, after we increment a given integer we make sure that they are gre uh, greater than 10 for a given option it should be equals to map of greater 10 uh, composed map of increment so we we do here we will do sum of 10 and increment it so it would be sum of 11 and then compose it and make sure if it is uh, greater than 10 and both of them will return true so this satisfies the composition law now we can say that option forms a functor and monad is, as I mentioned, all monads are functors. And it has an additional method, flat map. So we can have, uh, we can have a function that uh, for a given, the, the, that takes the initial, the current element and make another computation and build another, um, uh, program to uh, uh, to return it. Uh, we will see it by example and to, to make it uh, uh, like to be able to uh, construct to build um, a unit value for monad. We can add a function called point, for example, or it could be unit or pure, or um, and uh, this. Monad should satisfy identity and associativity laws. To see it clearer, let's take an example with option and make sure that option will satisfy these laws. Um, here, like uh, here to, to see it clear that point will just construct, uh, construct an option with a given a so it would be sum of A and map, it is the same implementation as before. And flat map, it will only, we only need to, to, um, to apply uh, the function with the current element. So it will return automatically option of B. Uh, to, to make sure that um, Monad satisfy the identity law, um, we need to, to see it, to see if it satisfies left identity and right identity for, for example, point A. Um, here you can see it as like sum of a given integer, um, but using a, a point function would make it clear for left and right identity because if I would have used sum of uh, a given integer, uh, dot flat map of a, a given function, you might say the sum might be none. So uh, this is why I use it uh, um, as uh, I use it the functions in uh, uh, Monad to for a given point A. When when we uh, do a flat map f of b, this because we, are, we didn't use uh, the previous method, the previous um, element, it should be equals to FB. So point A will not have, have any effect, uh, effect in uh, this. This will make sure that there is no side effects in uh, either in point or flat map. It should directly take this. For right identity, we will make sure that um, this will not have any effect uh, to the, the previous computation. So fa dot flat map point underscore, it should be uh, equals to the initial value. And for associativity, uh, it should, like we saw uh, in uh, uh, for mo monad, um, uh, monoids and uh, semigroup, um, it is, quite similar, but it is with a flat map uh, operation here. Um, and to make sure also that there is no uh, 
no side effects uh, and it shouldn't affect the, the result if we uh, call flat map separately like this or um, in a single flat map we, uh, we combine two other um, monads. Nice. Now we saw these uh, algebraic data structures. Each of them are defined by their own low uh, algebras, which are opera operator uh, operations and um, and the laws. We might already have worked with these ADT uh, um, ADS uh, um, algebraic data structures, and we also uh, like we uh, we might it's it might be familiar but we if uh, any one of you is uh, uh, heard about it the first time and then you might think oh i already worked with it i already worked with option which is um, which is a, a functor and a monad so we can uh, get uh, into this conclusion <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, also we saw that this uh, helps us to think as functional programmers. How could we make sure that we really, really follow the laws um, and we have no side effects? Um, and also extension methods are helpful to, uh, uh, in case if we have our specific types or even for options, um, uh, we want to have uh, to use a certain, um, uh, let's say, um, type classes that offers other uh, new features, and we want to use uh, them directly instead of extending, and instead of doing option extends this new type class, we can uh, use the extension methods by. Uh, uh, define an implicit class with a specific option and then add some uh, methods that you want to use. And uh, if you wonder how we would use Monad in real life, this is uh, a real example <laughs> uh, tweeted by uh, Egal. And that's it, here are some recommendations. Uh, if you want to start using functional libraries like CATS, Scala Z and Zio Prelude, it's a new project. You can watch the talk by John Dugos and Adam Fraser. They explained it. Um, and also, if you are interested about CATS, you can check out the talk by Jakub Kozlowski. And um, there is also other features uh, in types variances in Scala are very interesting to learn. If you would like to learn about them, you can check out the video. This video, uh, um, it was um, uh, like uh, Jakub uh, Kozlowski and me was uh, uh, where um, um, we uh, explained the variances in Scala. And uh, I highly recommend to join Functional Program in our course by Julian Truffaut. Uh, he, um, he gave uh, some practical examples to learn Scala and functional programming. Thanks a lot for your attentions and, uh, and uh, thanks to all the organizers for this amazing conference. Thank you.